Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Get to Know Your Scholar here on Bucky TV. I'm your host for this episode, Sean Abbas. I'm here with world renowned scholar, uh, speaker, and author, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Al Hilli. Welcome, Sheikh Hilli. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Oh, it's really great to have you here in the studio and great to have you in Chicago. Uh, for those who don't know, Sheikh Hilli is a staple here in Chicago, especially during Muharram and Safar. Uh, and we welcome him uh, every year, inshallah, and for years to come. Thank you very much. I love coming to Chicago. Mashallah, such a vibrant uh, community, very much uh, eager and thirsty for the knowledge from the Quran and Ahl al Bayt. So it's always wonderful to be here. Oh, thank you, Sheikh Ali. Now, uh, without further ado, can I uh, ask you some questions? To yes, get to know sure, you a absolutely. Bit? Yes. So I really want to get to uh, know you from the beginning. So can you tell us about? where you were born and your childhood? So I was born in Iraq, specifically in an area close to Kaldamein. Um, originally my family uh, from my father's side is from the Iraqi city of Hilla. And um, my great grandfather uh, was uh, Sheikh Muhammad Rabah, was a very well known uh, scholar and uh, reciter of Majalis in that area. Um, and. Uh, I was born in uh, Baghdad, but uh, we had to leave due to the oppression, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt specifically, and those who were against the uh, despotic Ba'athist regime. We had to leave th that uh, country, our country, and um, we went to Iran. So I stayed, my childhood primarily was in Iran, and it was a very interesting childhood because I recall, you know, the difficulty during the war and the sirens and the kind of economic hardships that people were going through because obviously the country was under international kind of mm -hmm. sanctions. Um, but I look at it positively because it really made, I feel, kind of gave me strength to deal with hardship from a young age. And um, it was something I look back and, and I have good fond memories of that particular childhood. Then when I was around 11 years of age, I, we, as a family, we moved to the United Kingdom and I have broadly been there since. Very nice, very nice. And I, I love that positive attitude for a tough time, uh, especially. We have to be, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So uh, as far as your Hosa studies and your studies, uh, where did you spend those mostly in the UK? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, I was very interested in Islamic sciences from early on. My father was very keen um, for this to begin from a young age. He would hold lessons for us when I was young and then would encourage me to give speeches um, in front of people at the times of the celebration of the Uladas of the Imams and other occasions. So it gave me confidence. Um, I started um, the kind of proper studying uh, of Hausa subjects. Um, when I was uh, about to enter university. So at the same time as I was studying for my pharmacy degree, I also studied, began studying Hausa studies in London uh, under the supervision of my teacher Ayatollah Milani in this um, institute which was called the Islamic Sciences uh, University. And uh, we, alhamdulillah, you know, continued for many, many years, even after I qualified uh, as a, a pharmacist, I continued uh, Hausa studies. And they continue till now. And of course, um, a few years ago, I went to Najaf to supplement the studies, and the studies continue till now. I teach, I also attend, because learning, and especially seminary kind of education, is not something that stops. It's something that we're always um, blessed with uh, to uh, acquire. Uh, and alhamdulillah, it's something that uh, has really, really, really been beneficial and has uh, helped me in, in so many ways. I guess, you know, people asking me today, why did you do it? As in, like, what was the sole, sole reason or the main uh, inspiration to uh, get into this kind of field? I didn't initially think that I wanted to become a speaker or muballigh. It was primarily because I wanted it to help myself and my understanding of religion and Islam. But then what happened was I realized, as I obviously was more and more into it, the gap and the need in the uh, Western world. English lecturing had just started. 
Um, funny enough, when I moved to the United Kingdom in 1989, I had no idea how to speak English. So oh. I, I, zero, no English at all. And subhanAllah, it's, it's always good when you do that when you're young and you, do, you, you, know, you can pick it up much right. easier than when you're uh, at an elder age or, or later stage in life. But alhamdulillah, I think things just worked out and it's all blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing to do with me, but it, in, in all honesty, uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, rise in the English lecturing and you know the opportunities that exist in different parts of the world now, where it's not only even in English-speaking countries. You have many countries in Africa, for example, where the, the lectures can be given in English. Even in Europe, you know, I've been to places like Switzerland and France and other places, Holland, where English is not the primary language in that country, but they want English lectures in English majalis. Right. So it's become a very important language. It's still catching up with, in terms of uh, the audience to languages such as Urdu, Arabic, and Farsi, mm -hmm. but it's on the rise for sure. Right, and you definitely, uh, uh, knowing that you didn't know how to speak English, now you're very much defined by your accent <laughs> in the English-speaking community. That's it. That's Marshall probably Love. why in America they love the <laughs> English accent from England, and people in England love the uh, American, American accent. accent. So it works kind of both ways. I yeah, know. We, we really appreciate all the work that you've done uh, on the English-speaking uh, uh, side. Uh, yes, it has really become a universal language, and I think you were one of the first speakers, or at least for the first uh, global speakers, to to propagate in English. So, uh, thank you for so your contribution. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, I know you've you've contributed to the community in multiple ways. Um, you know, you have your lectures, uh, you have your books, uh, and there's other initiatives that you are are very much part of. Out of everything that you've done up to your life. Thus far, and inshallah, Allah give you inshallah. a very long life and uh, give Need you everybody's du'as. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, what would you say is the one that you find uh, most inspiring or most uh, the one that you're most proud of? I guess it's difficult to pinpoint one, but if I was to have to choose one thing, um, I'm very passionate in the field of education, but preemptive education. Well, that what I mean by that is, you know, we have so many areas in our lives where we need development and understanding and social issues tend to be a major matter. So I'm very much involved in matters relating to mar marriage, parenting, and uh, alhamdulillah, the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we managed to establish an organization in the United Kingdom called Noor Islamic Education. And this was established many, many years ago, 2015. And what the idea behind it is not only does it disseminate uh, teachings of Ahlul Bayt through digital medium, mm -hmm. videos, posts, publications, but a major factor or part of it is courses and workshops. So we regularly over the years uh, organize uh, workshops for people who are about to get married, people who are already married, people who have children. And these are very kind of intense workshops, intensive but they provide really much needed tools to ensure a successful marital relationship. So we've called them, for example, the successful marriage course, the successful pre-marriage course, the successful parenting course. And alhamdulillah, over the last now, it's been six, seven years, it's continuous. So every year, a few are held. Due to the pandemic, we moved online. Mm -hmm. So we started to doing them over Zoom. And this opened up a global audience around the world who can join and take part. They're very interactive. So they're not like majalis or lectures. Majalis or lectures are beautiful because they have their own uh, you know, benefit. But when you have a type of learning which involves you know, facilitating people's own understanding and you kind of direct them and help them, it, it really, you know, we, we, I, I, I see the impact it has on people. You know, when you mention something, when you ask them to ponder over something and all of a sudden they're like, wow, yes, I never thought of this. I wish I had when I first got married, for example, mm -hmm. when I first had children. Um, in this day and age, I think, you, you, you know, most of us are somehow told that you can get into marriage or have kids without necessary foundations. But the reality of the matter is when we want to drive, we go through 
uh, like some kind of Driver's training, education. education. Yeah. Um, we want to learn any skills usually, uh, and if it's a slightly difficult skill, we go through some kind of manuals or we watch YouTube videos or whatever, and, and then we start practicing. And I think for marriage, a lot of people enter it thinking naturally they're able to deal with the challenges that marital relationship brings or parenting brings. Um, the vision that we have is we want to ensure that people who are about to get married in the future all as much as possible around the world go through some form of training, go through some form of education, interactive way. So I guess those kind of courses, alhamdulillah, have been something that um, it's all the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, have progressed and we hope that we can do more and more in the future. Inshallah, inshallah. So for our viewers out there, what's the best way to uh, get in touch or be able to participate in these workshops. So everybody's welcome to take part in these courses. Um, they can uh, follow us on Instagram, Noor Islamic Education. So the Instagram address is at Noor Islamic Education. The website is islamiced.org. So that's I S L A M I C E D.org, islamiced.org. And once you follow us or you subscribe on the um, website for free we can send you all the details and you can sign up to these courses and take part because now they're held uh, online so they're open to everywhere everyone around the world yeah, mashallah. sounds like a great initiative Alhamdulillah. so shifting gears just a little bit uh, to step back uh, a few years ago you you published a, a book uh, the Bucky Cemetery past present and future uh, I want to try to understand what was your inspiration in writing this book and you know why do you feel that it's important that people read it alhamdulillah you know i cannot be grateful enough to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me an opportunity to be able to you know author books i always joke with people and i say writing is the hardest thing you know you can speak all day long you can watch you can listen but to actually put pen to paper and to research and compile it's it's not easy but alhamdulillah this is this is great nirma and a lot of this tends to happen when i'm traveling to give lectures tablir like for example currently uh, I, I get a bit more time to sit and do a bit more research um but baqiya i guess two reasons uh due to the blessing of the almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and over the years i've been accompanying hajj groups and umrah groups the exposure to go to baqiya and every time i go to jannatul baqiya like so many people you cannot but feel a sense of grief. Your heart breaks over the state of the cemetery. And what is really astonishing is that this is a cemetery respected and revered by all Muslims. It's the oldest cemetery in Islamic history. And it has, of course, the graves of revered individuals, both in Sunni and Shia uh, Islam. And based on all this, not a single grave is identified. And people usually, you know, when we go, are either afraid, they're not allowed to recite ziyara, or identify the graves. And so they have these maps, and so you find people desperate for knowledge, desperate to ask someone, who's this grave? Where is this? What's the history? What is it all about? And when I looked into English literature on Jannat al Baqi, I saw articles online. I saw some publications here and there, which are short, like leaflets and so on. I didn't see a particular book which is uh, somehow as much as possible looking at all the aspects associated with Jannat al-Baqi. So that was the inspiration. I wanted to provide something that filled a massive gap in this particular area. So alhamdulillah, out of the books I've been blessed to write, I think Jannat al-Baqi one probably is my best project because it's a full color one. It has a new map, new map meaning 3D, uh, of the graves of Jannat al-Baqi that are, we, we identify as the ones that obviously people should go and uh, uh, appreciate and give respect to but also it has theological dimensions why should we build shrines it has a, a very nice uh, a chapter of uh, my dear brother Zuhair Husseini who has designed how the future Baqi shrine should look like um, and he's included that as well as well as obviously the history of the graves itself images of the past shrines how they work because today you know I know they're online but it's easy to dismiss and say you know what maybe there weren't any shrines because some people have told me that when I was there at Baqi it's easy just to say you know what nah, it's not something that existed just keep it that it is and I know for example Al Baqi organization has done really good work to really push for the cause but I thought that for example when we do that we need to give people something to say mm -hmm. look 
read this book. This is what's happened. This is how these uh, shrines were destroyed in 1925. This is the story of them because you'll have to take historical accounts and Alhamdulillah is able to get some uh, from various texts. And so uh, it was uh, um, really key that uh, together with the active work that we do, we have literature to support and to preserve the documents. For example, the, the declaration that was made in 1925 to destroy not only Jannatul Baqi but also Jannatul Jannatul Mu'alla in Makkah al Mukarramah. So it is to preserve history, but also to highlight what can be done for the future too. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Um, I hear that you have a story about doing ziyara in Jannatul al Baqi. Is that something you can share with yes, us? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, most of us have stories of Jannatul al Baqi right. because it is a place so special to the heart of the Prophet and the Ahl al Bayt, alayhum as -salam. Yet, of course, we are not allowed to go to the graves in the sense that we stand quite a few meters away, those of you who have been. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you opportunity to go again. And obviously, it's females and women are banned from going there since 1925. And I, you know, before sharing the story, I really think that that's something we should be really campaigning for in the world today that's calling for the rights of women. I think. Um, organizations such as Al-Baqi organizations that really are leading this particular cause of uh, rebuilding uh, Jannat Al-Baqi uh, can pressurize through international means for females to be given an opportunity to go. It doesn't have to be at the same time as males because they obviously have sensitivities for that. But just like how females are given specific time at the Prophet's grave, mm -hmm. That can be the same for the cemetery of Baqir. Okay. And in the world today that says, okay, why are we discriminating against females? I think this is a very, very worthy cause um, for our sisters who really suffer. They say, we've never seen these graves. We've never known how they look like. We've only look at them in pictures. So people can't get to these graves and there are soldiers always. And but Alhamdulillah, in one of the years, I was blessed to be able to go inside um, and, you know, through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wasil of Ahl al-Bayt, I was able to uh, uh, come and, you know, uh, be able to touch the actual four graves of the Imams, alayhum salam. I, it was an incredible feeling, really. Um, you know, my young sons were with me, my brother-in-law was with me, and, you know, it was dark at night, but I could still see the graves to be able to actually touch the grave of Imam Zain al-Abideen, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba, these honorable individuals. You know, we see them from far, and it, it breaks our heart that it's just a stone. And, you know, it's, it's like this, where the rest of the Imams have these amazing, beautiful shrines, and they're visited by millions on an annual basis. But having sat there and, you know, felt the grave in my own hands, I never forget that experience, those moments that I was able to get there before I was told, <laughs> move away, um, and I had to go. But it was it was a special experience, and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this should be in our du'as, we should never give up, we should be positive, we should always be focused, and, you know, uh, support organizations like Al-Baqi organization in this very noteworthy cause, because it is something that, number one, is a, a global uh, cause not only for Muslims it should be for all human beings this is a just cause number two specifically for Muslims there are Sunni and Shia uh, revered individuals but thirdly for the followers of Ahl al-Bayt this cause places happiness in the heart of the Holy Twelfth Imam may Allah hasten his reappearance because um, these are you know these are shrines that must be rebuilt for the remembrance of Ahl al-Bayt to be upheld so we pray that everybody inshallah will get that opportunity one day to be close to these holy places. Allah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a beautiful story, inshallah. I hope one day I am able to, 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 to touch the graves uh, in Jannat al-Baqi. Inshallah, inshallah. So just to lighten things up a, a little bit, um, kind of wrap up uh, this interview, I, I just wanted to do a little word association, yes. word play. So I'm going to throw a couple of words at you. Don't want you to think too much. Just you know, Straight. just whatever comes to your mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the first one is near and dear to my heart. So I, I wanted to throw this in there. Chicago, windy city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's we, the first thing that comes to your mind. It is not but I can say, a wonderful community, a really uh, passionate, uh, you know, for the service of Ahl al Bayt, and you feel that when you give the masaib and the liquor of Ahl al Bayt, they, they, are, you know, especially the Mu'minin in IACE, Asaini, and I'm sure other places as well, that has this that great passion for Ahl al Bayt. Thank you, thank you, and we always appreciate having you here. Thank you. So much. 
Uh, I'm not really answering one word, am I? I'm no, giving sentences. It, it, it doesn't have to be one word. It's just whatever comes oh, to your okay, mind. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So football. This is kind of a trick one. Well, um, <laughs> I have no idea about American football <laughs> because I feel that the actual word means soccer, as you guys call it soccer. But uh, I would have to say if it means soccer, then Liverpool, that's the team that I follow oh. and support and I go to see. Um, if, it's, if, it, if you mean the American football, uh, all I could say is I don't understand it and it's quite rough. <laughs> You just have to remember Tom Brady, that's all. Okay. That's that's I'm sure uh, some Manchester United people are probably upset at you uh, for being Liverpool. They are usually, but uh, <laughs> because we are followers and lovers of Ahlal Bayt, that's <laughs> kind of put aside. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. Um, a little bit on more serious note, Azadari, what does that bring to your mind? Passion, service, um, uh, dedication, the message of Imam Hussein remaining alive because of it, because you know, the, the followers of Ahl al-Bayt cannot, you know, underestimate how amazing this ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And it's really kept the flag of Karbala on the 10th of Muharram alive year after year. And, uh, you know, uh, Arba'een, the walk, everything, you know, without Azadari, it really wouldn't be the same at all. Subhanallah. Very well said. And then lastly, I know we've touched on this already, but just Bucky, the word Bucky, what is that? bring to your mind and to your heart? The first thing that I think about when I remember Baqi is sadness. Sad, you know, it's, 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 it's grief. It's truly known as the Yawm al-Gham, 8th of Shawwal, when we remember the destruction of Jannah al -Baqir. You feel that grief, that, that that cannot be separated from Baqi because, you know, everything, all the images that we have, although we can, we can think about these shrines that used to exist, but sadly, what imprints in our minds is, is those is those stones on top of the graves and the leveled shrines in, in, in the cemetery today. Um, but at the same time, when I remember Baqir, there is great hope in my heart. There is a lot of positive anticipation. Um, we, you know, the, we, this idea that we should, must never give up, this idea that the shrines will be rebuilt, inshallah. We will be able to perform ziyarah safely and without intimidation. We will be able to uh, hold majalis there and do matam there and azadari there. That the visitors of Baqi will be, inshallah, as great in number as the visitors to Karbala, as the visitors to Mashhad, as the visitors to Sayyid Zainab, as the visitors to the other shrines of the Ahl al-Bayt, because that's the least those holy individuals deserve to have those visitors. So at the same time as there is grief, there is great hope and positivity, inshallah, that this will be soon. Inshallah, inshallah, we will see uh, Jannat al Baqi rebuilt in our inshallah, lifetime. Inshallah. And inshallah, maybe you and I can do ziyad together. Ilahi ameen. That's the hope, inshallah, and the prayers. Well, I want to thank you again, Sheikh, for, for joining us and for being in Chicago. Uh, I want to thank the viewers for tuning in to uh, Sheikh Muhammad al Hilli, who has joined us all the way here from uh, London, UK. Uh, and for those who like the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel to support Bucky TV and the Bucky organization. I thank you all for, for tuning in.